still say it's a pleasure. I'm with the Harvard Club of Southern California, and I was asked to try to organize um, a Zoom event for the book that Paul wrote. Oh, I'll get it wrong. Harvard, Hollywood, Hitmen, and Holy Men. Um, and I will say I was mesmerized by the book. Um, I agree with the uh, reality of conditions within we, which we have been living. And I uh, was mesmerized by Paul's evolution through so many ways of finding how to live with where we are now, including um, just really not buying into things that are greedy and immoral so what else can i say huh. i just and i and he's funny so and i guess many of you know him already so i just figured we'd have him talk and if you can stay muted if you have questions because there's something that is burning in your head i uh, just put it in the chat and i will um figure it out and and convey it to paul or you can do it to all, and Paul can look at the chat himself. Well, I think it's better they give it to you because uh, it'll distract me. To, okay, so just know. send it to Marsha, Hirano Nakanishi. Uh, just say Marsha. I'm sure it's I'm a button there somewhere. And uh, I'm so glad you all have come. I hope you all love the book. If you don't know Paul, and for those of you who know Paul, I'm so happy that Morgan Chu. So nice to see you and Eva. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Cause. Hi, hi, hi. Hi. Cause we were a little bit late cause we had lunch to see what we were going to talk about. And by the time it was over, I had to drive back here from the west side. All right. Well, okay. Two. Let me just start by saying that I originally wrote this book uh, for myself. I really, you know, I'm an old fellow. I'm 79 years old. I don't know how much longer I have to go. And it was like a, uh, a it was like a ritual to be done before I die. Uh, simply to allow the energy to roll off the memories of the traumas of my life so that I would be more empty and clear when I died. That was my purpose in writing the thing. Uh, then actually one day a film historian called me trying to get in touch with Ed Pressman and we got to chatting and I said, well, maybe you'd like to re enjoy reading this thing. And so I sent it to him and the next day he called back saying, gee, we could, I could get this published. And I said, well, right, whatever. And then two days later, I got a call from the University Press of Kentucky Screen Classics saying they wanted to publish it. And that next Monday, I got a call from the head of the uh, publishing house and she said she really wanted the book. So on some level, then Paul Cronin wrote an, another anthology using a lot of the material I didn't put in the book. And he's a quite a good film historian. And some of his students were running a retrospective in New York for the films. And uh, so he created a bit of a uh, swirling wind here around the book. And then this... California thing happened when when Tarantino said some nice things in his book and the New Beverly uh, decided to show the films tomorrow at 7.30 and 9.30 out of it and the revolutionary and on Wednesday also 7.30 and 9.30 the revolutionary well out of it in the revolutionary there'll be a Q&A in between the films. And on Wednesday at 4.30 at the Kibitz room at Cantor's there'll be a meet and greet and book signing. And for those of you who ever go to Larry Edmonds bookshop, I'll be there on Thursday. Um, but all of this is at odds of why I wrote the book, which was, uh, you know, it had to do with my personal evolution. 
And so this dust of ego swirling around, uh, you know, has to be uh, dealt with. And uh, it's one of the interesting parts of this whole situation. Um, I don't know what else, how, uh, are there any questions anybody has as yet, or should I move on? Well, I'll say that I think part of what made your book so much fun is that you, you actually kind of knew who all your classmates were and your roommates, and you actually put the year in which they graduated. Huh. It's pretty strange. Um, and that you went out of your way to actually try to audit everyone's most wonderful classes. Uh -huh. And I mean, I will say that's part of what makes Harvard pretty special. Well, thinking of it from a Harvard point of view, certainly one of the thing, one of the prime things I wanted to get out of the experience was learning or seeing how the smartest people thought and spoke because I didn't know what the limits of intelligence was. Uh, and, uh, it was very clear to me I was not the most intelligent person at Harvard. Uh, yet I wanted to understand people who were more, whose brains worked better than mine. And so I was, I, I made it a point to see Kissinger asked to be in his uh, seminar or Reinhold Niebuhr, or uh, I had uh, John Kenneth Galbraith as a tutor for a while, and Eric Erickson and B.F. Skinner, uh, and a bunch of other people. Um, and uh, I was I was delighted to know that I could understand what they were saying, and I could speak in a manner in which they could understand. And that was a very useful thing because it improves your confidence a little bit. You know, when you're a young man, you don't know, maybe you're much, much smarter than I was. Because my experience was coming from a lower middle-class family. And then uh, at about the age of 11, becoming part of the middle-class, that was a new filter, new kind of experience to see how people in the middle class lived. And then of course, going to Harvard is another filter because suddenly you become, uh, you see who these people are who rule the world. I was six foot three and weighed 162 pounds. And so the uh, crew, the crew coaches asked me to uh, row freshman year. And you know, there were seven guys from prep, Theodore Roosevelt the fourth and Jack Lowell, you know, the, the Lowell's speak, the Cabots speak only to the Lowell's and the Lowell's speak only to God. And there were, you know, St. Paul's and Grotten's and all these people growing, plus me from Massapequa High School. But that was a you know, revelation uh, about a whole nother uh, level of society. So um, it, 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 when I got there, it was not only the social economic thing, it was also these people who were super duper bright, not only students, but faculty. And I, I was very interested in uh, being next to them and getting a frame of reference on what was uh, acceptable as smart thought. And my roommate, uh, Howard Gardner, who became very, he got one of MacArthur, became very famous in educational circles. Uh, he's kind of a superstar of education said to me, you know, Paul, you're not the smartest one in any subject, but you're the second smartest in more subjects than anybody. So I had to be satisfied with that. And uh, so in some sense, these are the lunatic ravings of the second rate mind, but uh, one that was honest and looking for uh, uh, a way to live life in a meaningful way. Um, uh, well, that, that was a wrap. Anything, any reactions to that? All right. Well, what would you like to hear now, Marsha? Well, I want to know how Actually, you... Has anybody read the book? Has anybody read the book? 
Oh, okay. I want to know how you got to play basketball with Fidel Castro. Well, I, you know, I, I'd rather not simply repeat stories from the book. I okay. I like to run and get it. I'll read it. Because uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of time figuring out how to tell them, you know, effectively. But I'll just cut to the chase on Fidel. See, there's a whole story. How do I get next to him? And, and, you know, how we came to be playing basketball together. Uh, that's a big story from the book. And it's... Uh, God, do you want me to tell that story? People in the audience, yes, no? You don't care? Yes. 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 What? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, okay. So anyway. It's in the book. What? It's in the book. Yeah, I'm saying it's in the book. So what it's are we in the to... book. Yeah. So what are we going to talk about it for? It's something else. Ask me something else. Well, I have a question. question. Okay, just talk. Somebody out there ask. I have a question. Go. Has your sister read the book? I don't know. Because I'm very interested in her reaction to that uh, cosmically brave story you told about uh, uh, the book you found in the... Uh, Room that got kept getting stolen back and forth. Yeah, Fanny Hill, Stories of a Woman, a Woman of Pleasure. It was a piece of pornography from France. It's a classic. But, you know, uh, that story is, uh, is uh, well, it reminds me, of course, of Blood of the Wall Songs by Thomas Mann, and the story of the brother and the sister there. Um, but no, I don't think she's, she may have read it, but I doubt it. I haven't heard from her. I also I have a comment about the or and a question. How did you come up with the composition of it with the short breaks? It made it very easy to read a lot at one time and also good places to stop and pick up with. Well, the book started with my making a list. Originally, it was just going to be a a book about extraordinary experiences, experiences out that include other realms besides the one we're accustomed to calling reality. So I just, because I felt that deserved to be written about, that normally people don't know about such things. They were very important to me. And I wanted to write them down for my own edification about how these extraordinary events added up and influenced me during my lifetime. So I came up with about 72 of them. And I just started writing placeholders for each one, a few sentences to remind me of the place, the time, certain images. And that was really the beginning of the book was those 72 extraordinary experiences. And then I went back enlarging some of them, leaving some of them out. And uh, I tried to do it in as simple language as I possibly could. And I also was trying not to tell people how to feel about anything. I just wanted to present the material in an objective way. So uh, that sort of determined the style of the piece. Uh, you know, he said, she said, this happened, that happened. And you can draw your own conclusions about the emotional result of what you what the characters must have felt. Um, although in certain cases, like the name change and certain other things, I talk about how dramatic it was. But that was later. The original thing was just the 72 extraordinary experiences. And then I started filling in around that some of the other more extraordinary real life experiences that I had. And that's basically how the structure emerged with these vignettes, which at first were very simple and some of them grew to being longer, but I definitely wanted to, there, there's a way that sense memories work. Actors know about this. You have to really relax and then you try to get the smell and then you try to get the other senses and then you start to get the visuals and the dialogue and stuff like that. And so I wanted in some sense, each of these vignettes to be, uh, uh, 
a contained memory. In other words, the idea was to download the emotional significance of each of these events. So that's sort of determined the length of the vignette. It was that was the unit of trauma, so to speak. And that was the unit that was to be dealt with. I thought I uh, one last comment, then I'll let someone else like, ask a question. But I found myself it evoked, even though a totally different life, and uh, but it started evoking memories of my own childhood and different things that I was like, oh, you know, I thought it was fascinating how it was composed and what it was making me think of, even though it wasn't in the book, uh -huh. my own life. Right. Well, that's good. I think any piece of art, you know, a good movie, a good painting, a good book, I always call it the experience being sent home because the thing is true in some, and beautiful in some deep way, it sends you home because at home is where you had the most real and intense and meaningful experiences. Uh, and so being sent home is, I think, a, a high praise. Uh, and I appreciate that. You're, you're not a math science person. <laughs> you're a visual and psychology person. I understand you spent many hours in the dark room at the Crimson Button. Is that what leads you into film or... Was there more serendipity or? Well, no, I was, I was a, a very, you know, I was a precocious photographer and it, photography, still photography, gave me many advantages while I was at Harvard, certainly, uh, uh, which I detail in the book. Um, and I got quite good at it. I was hired as a senior to help teach the photography course. Uh, and uh, I wanted to, well, I don't know how to say this. I, uh, I wanted to go to Europe. I couldn't afford it. Uh, so I looked around for anthropologists and I found Lawrence Wiley. It's in the book, uh, who is a C. Douglas Dillon professor of French civilization at Harvard. He really liked my photographs and wanted me to do the photographs for his book. He was writing about the village of Chanzo in Manigouar. Uh, and before I left, he decided I should shoot some movie footage too in the village. And he called C. Douglas Dillon, who was secretary of the treasury of the United States. And he gave me some more money to go shoot some film. And uh, that's how I got to Europe. I did it all in three weeks and spent nine weeks traveling around going to the great art museums. Uh, but uh, that was really the first film I ever did was that documentary about the French village in 1964. Strangely enough, French TV, Channel 5, I think, two years ago, did a new version of my documentary with the same characters you know, 50 years later, and it was hmm. on TV, and they cut back and forth between mine and theirs. It was, it was interesting. But anyway, I sort of was learning a lot about film. In the book, I tell about some other things, but it really came down to one moment. I was at the Brattle Theater, and I was watching an Italian movie, I think by one of the Olmi brothers. I don't really remember. I didn't really understand the movie. It was an Italian but I did watch very carefully how the people moved, how the camera moved. And I realized I had enough skills to make a movie. So it was very different from Scorsese or Spielberg or uh, Francis Coppola, who were all deeply into movies their whole lives. They really knew everything they wanted to know. And they really wanted to be film directors. I just, I needed a way to go. That was a guy who's, what am I going to do next? And I had actually applied to Harvard Law School and got in. But uh, the, my girlfriend at the time said she didn't want to be married to a lawyer. So I figured, all right, I'll try movies. And uh, uh, that's when I sat down and started writing uh, a film. Uh, 
And, and you're not in the book. That girl yeah. later married a Yale lawyer. Excuse me. And and I thought that girlfriend later married a Yale lawyer. Wasn't that the point? One of the points That's you made. Right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 A Yale lawyer. On the exact day we had gotten married, the same date. June 23rd. Yeah. Plus, Paul also got smashed in the nose in Europe, in in Britain, by another Yaley who was a much better... Princeton, no, oh, he was from Princeton. Princeton, talking about the final four. I'm oh, sorry, school. Bill Bradley, yes. Bill Bradley was from Princeton. Oh, yeah, well, you know, I, I couldn't make a high school team in America. But nobody in Britain played basketball in 1965. So I was able to play for the Cambridge University varsity. And my first, very first game, I jumped at center against their six foot five guy, six foot six, who out jumped me and then took the ball, bounced it in his right hand, switched it to his left put his elbow in my face and broke my glasses into my eye and shot a easy layup. And they took me to the hospital, but that was Bill Bradley. That was my big college basketball career. Uh, I, I told my wife that story and she wanted me to ask you, was Bill Bradley really that dirty a player? Well, I, you know, in all fairness to him, I don't think he was trying to break my glasses. I think it was just his smooth moves, you know. I mean, you watch those basketball players. They're stronger and faster than you can ever imagine. It's really like another... It's, it is as if they're different realities. You know, we're every day... They're bigger, they're so fast, and they play the game much higher up in the air than, you know. We're... we're it's just it's just a different game uh, when you get next to. I mean, I was in Rome uh, making a film in 1980 and met in my hotel. There were two tall African Americans who were playing for Banco di Roma, uh, and we used to have breakfast together because we were in the hotel. Anyway, make a long story short, they invited me to play with them on Banco di Roma. Each Italian team was allowed two players, two Americans. And uh, so I went down to play with them and I couldn't believe how big they were, how strong they were, how fast they were, how they could change direction and how high they could jump. I mean, I really felt like that was some, they must've been on some basketball drug. I don't know. But anyway, my, my basketball career. So you you were immersed in 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 the Hollywood scene in uh, the Warren Beatty, Julie Christie, et cetera period in 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 the canyons, but you also but one of your friends became close with Huey Newton, right? Yeah, he they were best friends. And I, that is like it's almost. Like, I wasn't sure how these things were bumping up against each other. Well, I don't know. Again, did it seem like most people did have not yet read the book? So probably it's okay to tell a little bit of the story. But basically, I had been in North Africa uh, with Eldridge Cleaver. Uh, I was going to make a documentary about the Panthers to help raise money to get Bobby Seale uh, and Erica Huggins, I guess, out of jail. And it, at the time, the North Koreans also showed up and they started planning a kamikaze attack on Manhattan, which was far beyond what I thought I was getting into. And uh, I eventually left Algiers uh, after a lot of good adventures that are worth reading the book for. And uh, I was taken off the plane in Marseille and in Paris. And eventually when I got back to New York, the FBI was starting to talk to my friends and coworkers. And uh, right about that time, John Calley at Warner Brothers sent me dealing uh, the book by the Crichton Brothers. 
And I didn't even read the book. I said, yes, just to get out of New York. I figured if I were making a movie for Hollywood studio, I wouldn't get arrested. Uh, and when I got to California, oh no, then I made that movie. What, what I, does anybody know when Five Easy Pieces was made? What year? Okay, I'm trying to get my dates right, but basically the BBS crowd invited me to make a movie with them. That's Bob Rafelson and Bert Schneider and Steve Lauer. And, uh, and Bert, you know, knew about me and Huey. And so his best friend, uh, me and Eldridge Cleaver, and his best friend was Huey Newton. So he wanted me to meet Huey. I, at that point, was finished, I thought, with radical politics and much more interested in spiritual matters. I wasn't interested in dialectic so much as unitary thinking and life beyond the ego. Anyway, but Bert was my good buddy and he said, please come up. So I went up to Oakland where Lenny Weinglass, who was a famous constitutional lawyer and six other lawyers were in a, on a couch. Huey was in a big chair facing them. And I was on the end and he asked, why is the foreman of this jury, he was on trial for murder, going to vote for me to be uh, convicted of second class, second degree murder? And Lenny Weinkerass didn't answer, and none of the other lawyers answered. So after a while, I said, oh, because the chairman, the black chairman of the jury thought he was saving your life. Because in the next trial, if there were one, the next head of the jury would vote for first degree murder. So he, he did a double take and he said, who are you? And I said, I'm Bert's friend, Paul. He didn't, I, we hadn't been introduced at that time. And he said, well, stay here. And then everybody else went back to LA and I stayed uh, at Huey's for a couple of days and we talked at great length, which is reported in the book. And then I used to go up there every couple of weeks and we, have cocaine in a huge bowl and a Bowie knife. And uh, we'd stay up all night talking about our mother's love and stuff. Anyway, it's all in the book. It's good stuff. Is that a followable story? I, I of course, loved it because I, I also loved Huey Newton. And, and well, he was quite a, quite a, quite, quite a good, person. And a funny guy, too. So you you basically left you did the movies but decided not to do the movies. Then you did uh, radical politics and documentaries, but then you went on a quest to sh to shed even more because because circumstances weren't getting better, and you wanted to explore more about. Well, what it really was is, you know, when you, there were all those drugs around, there's peyote, acid, MDA, not MDMA, MDA, all these really strong drugs, which Andy Wilde called sacraments. In other words, that the drugs gave you an experience of the ex extraordinary high. And without that experience of the high, you wouldn't go back and do all the work that's necessary to get that high unless you realize there was something worth working for. So he called the drug sacraments. But anyway, after a certain number of years of just using drugs to experience all these extraordinary states, I decided that I would actually go and study uh, and do the work. Uh, the first, I remember the very first book I read was Autobiography of a Yogi by Yogananda which is a very good introduction to the whole field. But then there's a whole lot more you can read, which I did. And then at one point, a guy named Oscar Chazo, who did a, had a meeting with it, Indries Shah, who was head of the Sufi movement on the planet in London. And uh, Andy Weil played me a tape of their discussion about giving a new teaching, which had not been given since 1914, when Gurdjieff had a 
teaching uh, in Switzerland. And Hermann Hesse was there and Rebel. The Bolero is actually a composition for one of the Sufi exercises. All kinds of people went to study with Gurdjieff. Anyway, so this was going to be another training. This was like 1973. And uh, listening to the tape, I decided I was going to do it. And uh, I punked down the, the only money I had left, which they were charging, I think it was 5,000 a head. And uh, because I really felt that, you know, fame and fortune certainly weren't making me happy. And I had to discover uh, new realms. And fortunately, one of the other people in the, in the group was a uh, heiress of the Wirehouse of Fortune, who then gave a lot of money to the group and it was distributed among the members. So that I got my money back, plus they paid me $1,500 a week to study. So that was good. And uh, I spent a year at it. And, uh, it, and it was quite, a, quite an experience and it was very successful. I mean, I've been pretty happy since 1973. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically taught you how to be empty at will. And that's the beginning place for all the higher uh, meditations. Could, could I make a comment about the, about the book, sort of following up on something that Marsha was asking? Sure. Um, as, as she related, there is just an absolutely extraordinary collection of famous people on one page to the next to the next to the next and you know reading the book the only real connection between them is paul williams yeah. it, no seriously there, there seems to be something about you and I, I couldn't quite tell what it was from reading the book i'm getting a little bit more of the attitude about it by, by seeing you in person but you have a very special maybe spiritual i don't know what it is power to attract and keep the attention of famous in some cases rich in some cases highly spiritual individuals so you have this incredible list of stories from your life all of which have names of people that we've heard of before i, I thought it was really interesting because i'm class of 69 uh -huh. so almost all of the professors that you were discussing were still around when I was there and I had uh -huh. courses for many of them and similar impressions of them. Um, I'm a math science guy, so I was taking math uh -huh. science classes, but I, I sort of loved the way you um, talked about the little sub communities within Harvard, where there were people in the Crimson and people in, in the crew and people in your room and stuff who all form their own little subsets and, 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 right. and coexisted and stuff. And that was a, that was a very nice way I thought of describing the university and I didn't expect I would be as interested in the rest of the book but you sort of you, you dragged me in you know like talking about Julie Christie and various other people who are also you know idols of mine I'm only a little bit younger than you uh but and and then going on to all of the stories about the interactions between Hollywood and the mob and politicians and the mob <laughs> and then I and and then finally all of the spiritual deep quest and the other thing about the book that I was very impressed with is you appeared to be very aware of the dangers of neoliberalism before uh, many of the rest of us caught on to this charade that was going on. You know, we 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 used to we used to say trickle down economics doesn't work, but right. that there's a lot more to it than that. There's actually genuine science behind the fact that this is corrupt and degrading, and all, all the points that you made in the book. Right. So it. It, I, I, I never would have thought all of that stuff possibly could have worked together in a single <laughs> book. You know, I mean, it, it, there are so many vital issues and, and just, you know, things about the last half of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century in America and in the world that are described in the book. And somehow or other, they actually all do come together with, with Paul Williams as the, as the, as the, as the threat. I, I was also very sympathetic because I, my family also had a name change. I, I still uh -huh. think you have a New York accent. I can hear New York coming out of your voice. I hope you don't yes. mind my saying that. Well, but when I was at Harvard, I, I can, actually on my first LSD trip, I, I stopped trying to hide my New York accent. I just, <laughs> you know, prior to that, I did a pretty good job.
So, I mean, I, I, you, you, no longer, no you, longer. You, 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 I mean, you should, you should hear it in me also. I haven't lived in New York because I was born in the Lower East Side and stuff. My, my father changed his name from Ginsburg to Gaines in uh -huh. the 30s when he was going to NYU Law School. It was something very similar to the experience that, you were, that your father enforced on you 20 years later. Yeah, he, but he was a little late, you know what I mean? And I unfortunately was the victim of it. But in fact, that's really why I wrote, that started the book was my friend Charlie, who I've known for 50 years, said, you better deal with this Goldberg thing before you die. And so, you know, I started writing about that and trying to come to terms with it. But it was, it was a, I'm a product of a pretty crazy family. So, anyway, but thank you, thank you so much for the book. It was really, hey, really thank you, thank you for the, the comments and appreciation. That's great. But and by the way, apropos of you know being ahead of the curve on the this sickness and the disparity of income and the you know I had a I had first John Galbraith as a as a tutor and he certainly alerted me to. He thought any industry that creates its own need was immoral. <laughs> that was sort of it. I never had thought of that. And then, of course, the Panthers really understood that change had to take place on a local level that was important. And uh, so uh, it was clear to me from a fair, and of course, because I grew up in the Bronx uh, in the early years it really was clear to me that there was uh, there was something very corrupt about this, uh, that the system, you know, there's nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, as an economist, we know that capitalism is a tremendous engine for the creation of wealth through efficient allocation of resources. It's the best economic system there is for productivity and wealth generation. I mean, the Chinese know it and the Russians know it and the Indians know it, they all have their own versions. They all believe in the religion of capitalism and the God of money. They all agree about that. They just have different uh, flavors of it. And frankly, there's nothing wrong with capitalism itself if you distribute the products, the wealth in a socially fair way. I mean, in the 1950s, when I was growing up, the max tax was 94%. And eventually people, the rich people started taking over the Congress, taking over, making, stealing the money from the poor and the middle-class legal. And now we have a system where it's totally legal. They're not breaking any laws. There's a, there's a system which basically impoverishes most of the people to keep them working. And a very few people have, uh, uh, obscene amounts of money. I mean, there was a nice uh, dinner party I heard about between that Steven Spielberg and, and Tom Hanks were at. And they were discussing, well, uh, somebody was saying how they'd gotten this new jet. And, you know, somebody said, well, darling, we don't have to bend down to get into our jet, do we? But anyway, what is that? You know, when you have so many homeless and hungry people, uh, and more importantly, you know, a climate that's absolutely collapsing. And so I, I've, as an economist who's read Marx, and I can say he got it wrong. The dialectic isn't that capitalism will lead to socialism. It's that capitalism will lead to the gas chamber. And uh, that capitalism actually creates its own uh, death scene. Um, by uh, holding money more important than uh, compassion and human uh, community. So I was just saying to somebody before that Hannah Arendt said that the Jews who ended up in the concentration camps in the gas chambers were people with hope. They were very hopeful that, you know, they get on the train and they were going to go to a nice new place that was fun to be. And they ended up in a gas chamber. Whereas those Jews who didn't have hope, that who were fearful, had courageous action, either to fight or to get out of Dodge. And I think the world is very much at that point now where you get all these wonderful delusions of hopefulness from the fossil fuel companies on TV and the 
the, the, the news readers, everybody acts as if, oh, we're going to solve this thing. When, you know, the Gates scholars in Cambridge, who were among the smartest in the world, and their teachers are quite clear that we're about 50 years too late to do anything that will avoid catastrophe. And yet that doesn't make it into the consensus reality. So uh, I don't know, that seems, and, and by the way, the last week or two, you know, I've come out of the Brazilian jungle where I live and I bumped into, you know, a lot of distinguished thinkers and I've been talking to them and I've, they are very pessimistic. They don't seem to say it in public, but boy, I, I, I think it's uh, quite amazing, frankly. Uh, anyway, I'm going on about that. So you 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 studied the the Sufi things, and that's what led you to my favorite person in the book, besides yourself, <laughs> Go. Bill Go, who you also saw right. at the moment that he died while sitting in an airport. Yeah, of course, at the time, I didn't know he had died. All I knew is it's at a stopover at Denver and this 12 foot by 12 foot, it seemed to be hallucinogenic image appeared in front of me. But it wasn't because I could move my head right and left and up and down and the image wouldn't move. So I knew it wasn't a hallucination. Um, and I only later found out 10 years later that that was the day he had died. Uh, but so what made him so special? What is it that, what made you able for him to reach you? Well, well, two things. One was I had spent a year uh, working full time on, you know, moving energy around my body and being able to halt thought at will so I could be empty and go into void whenever required. And I just finished that training when I was invited to a event where they were trying to raise money to uh, get the Tibetan texts out of, out of uh, Tibet because the Chinese were coming in. And, uh, and I went to that party and it was mostly New York shrinks and writers, plus about 10 uh, monks. And uh, the, the, the white people were mostly shrinks and writers, and they were talking in hushed tones as if they were in a church or something. And what I knew about Tibetans is they weren't like... So I just started chatting, and I saw a seven-year-old with a top knot in the orange road, and I started playing with him with the puppets hand puppets, and we were having a very good time. And suddenly there was this pressure on the side of my head. Nobody was touching me. And it pushed my head around to the right. And I was looking into this huge man. He was about six foot seven or eight, but he was sitting on a bed and he had the brightest eyes I ever saw. And so I turned back to the little kid and he did my little bow and walked over to the big guy and said, uh, I, my name is Paul, Paul. And I hit him on the side of his shoulders. And I said, what's your name? And the chief librarian of Tibet, I found out later was sitting next to him and said, uh, translate for him. And he said, oh, Dingo, oh, Dingo. And he started hitting me on the sides of my shoulders. Uh, and it hurt because he was strong. And then I, I was a wise guy, so he had these incredible eyes. And I looked right into them and I said, uh, how do you like being on the road trying to raise money? Because they were there to get money for the, get the texts. And he looked at me and suddenly I was a good four feet away from him. The pressure on the side of my head started again and it pushed me to the side again. And I saw the wall Jeffrey Steingarten's wall of books start to dissolve. And I was in what looked to me like a street in India. An ox walked by me. In the book, I detailed the visual tests I did to 
ascertain that it was I was actually there and not hallucinating. I checked parallax. I turned in a 360 degree circle. I looked at the horizon going up and down. And uh, when I, in my heart, believed that I was in fact there, suddenly Jeffrey's wall reappeared in front of me, the wall of books. I knew it, this place was just beyond the wall. And uh, then we started like a three hour conversation. All the people in the room came around us and uh, he did something called tantric theater on me, which is I, by that time had all kinds of brilliant thoughts about how the ego worked and what are archetypes of personality and how they interact and what they do at different levels. And every time I came up with another brilliant idea, he would make it disappear. So at the end of two hours, I literally had no, no thought left whatsoever. And uh, that's when I decided I should be an actor, by the way. I said, gee whiz, this is like the reverse of being an actor. An actor expresses to get to emptiness. A good actor doesn't have anything in his head. Uh, it just works from the emptiness. It reacts. You don't act, you react to the person in front of you. Uh, and I realized that that's where East and West really meet. The actor expresses the emptiness, the Buddhists detach to emptiness, but they still have emptiness at their center. Hmm. And I decided to go back uh, and study the Sandy Meisner technique, uh, which I did. Uh, but the answer is that I later found out that Dilgo, uh, who did, was the, the Dalai Lama acknowledged him as his principal teacher, taught through vision, through uh, vision teachings. It was not, uh, that was what he was known for. He could, he could send you places, no drugs, no nothing. So that was fairly extraordinary. It, it changed my life in the sense that I realized there really were extraordinary beings on the planet. Of course, he did spend 13 years in a cave, you know, but he spent more time at it than I did. Is that a good enough? That's the answer. So once you once you found those essences, is that how you end up saying, I guess I'm gonna go to Brazil? Or do other things happen? Really? No, I but the Brazil thing came because at some point I moved out of the city and started living off grid you know, without neighbors, with a well and uh, solar panels and shipping container and a trailer. And I lived there for many years uh, and became my, if you live in nature continually, continuously for many years, you start seeing things that you couldn't see. You know, architecture has an effect on what you can actually see. I mean, if you live in a room with verticals and horizontals and solid walls most of the time or streets and houses you, you there are really few straight lines in nature uh, and there are a lot more uh, uh, colors and changes and wind and light and all kinds of things and you're seeing actually improves so that you can almost you can start to see the essence of plants as well as their actuality. Uh, so uh, I spent this many years on the, on, in, in nature. And when my girlfriend at the time said she was, she was half Portuguese, uh, half Brazilian, half American, said she was going back to Portugal with her family. I said, well, I'll take my bed and massage table. Maybe I'll follow you down there one day. Anyway, I eventually did follow her, and uh, and I liked it. We lived in the Rio, but then we moved out. She had a house in the jungle, and that's where we've been for some time. Where it's just it's a whole different vibration. I mean, you look out on the forest, you see two hundred fifty square miles, and there are trees and jungle everywhere. So it's a whole different 
visual and vibrational space that you live in. Um, so I don't know if that's an answer or not. You can push me if you want. I mean, in some ways, you know, I was like a hippie running away from what I thought was a failed society and a failed state. And, um, and also as an older geezer, I'm beginning to, you know, in that when you're younger, you have the problem of generativity and creativity. And as you get to be older, as Erickson would say, the problem becomes, can, do you see yourself as part of the processes of nature, your integrity as being part of nature? You were born, you grow old, you know, and you die and you go back. Um, so for old people, it's integrity versus despair rather than generativity versus stagnation. And so in some sense, I thought Brazil would be a very interesting place uh, to uh, uh, allow oneself to participate more fully with nature in all the sensorial ways. Um, and it was, I gotta say, when Reagan, Ronald Reagan was president, he didn't make a move in international relations without consulting a uh, uh, some lady astrologer, star chart person. I forget her name now, it's in the book. But I had seen her about 10 years earlier and she drew a line around the world for me. She said, and the only place that line reached land was Rio de Janeiro. And she says, you'll be happiest there. That was in 1974, so this was, you know, so 50, a half century later, but anyway. So do you have, unless someone else has a question. Can, can I ask Paul, can I ask Paul a question? Sure. Hi, this is Zappy Zaplin. I'm a psychedelic concierge to the stars and i just was i'm excited to read your book i haven't read it yet but i'm thrilled to read it oh, and i just wanted to, yeah I, I wanted to see what your uh what your psychedelic uh regimen is these days if any just curious there's no psychedelic regimen for me these days that most of my visions have not are done without drugs um i can i'll tell you two quick stories one mda i took it way before mdma which is like one tenth as strong as mda mda is like ass 500 mics of acid in your heart it's a heart opening drug you can't move on mda uh anyway I mean, when I took MDA, it was one of the biggest experiments. More, even I'd say it was almost it, it's exactly as important as acid was to my mind. MDA was important to my heart. Wow. And uh, anyway, make it so short. A few years later, when I was acting and I had studied acting for some time, which is really a, a heart opening experience if you do it right, I took some MDA just to see on stage to see if it was what the effect would be. And there was none, very little, you know, a little bit, of, but not much. Just like after the first 10 trips on LSD, if you run the Bardos, mm -hmm. if you're talking about, you, you, yep. you know, once you transmute those uh, images and experiences, you get to an, a place that's fairly clean. It's it's still vibrant and uh, exciting, but it's on some level quite free of hallucination um, or major hallucination. I mean, it's still a visual thing. And yet, and if you give five hundred mics of acid to a holy man uh, to a high lama, it doesn't do much for them. Yeah. So, um, I guess what. Uh, I mean, there are drugs like peyote, which, or ayahuasca, which are a different, I think a different kind of trip, which actually brings you to a culturally specific place. Uh, 
Well, I think we're getting pretty far out for this conversation. Yeah, yeah. No, I just want to tell you the, the reason I, uh, reach, I was speaking up was I did write a screenplay during this time uh, called Psychedelic Soldier, because I think we have to have screenplays that ask big ethical questions. But I heard that that was the name they were maybe going to call Apocalypse Now, according to Coppola. And I'm one, and I... When I saw your background with rev the revolutionary and stuff, I'm I'm really inspired to see that movie ASAP. Great, great, great. You know, it's funny. Milia showed me Apocalypse Now, the script, and uh, I loved his script. And I, it's this story is in the book. Have you read the book? No, I haven't. I can't wait. Well, I'm getting it tomorrow. Funny. Basically, I call I love this story, and I figure I can do it like a documentary style in the Philippines for a couple of million dollars. Because, uh, you know, and I, I called Francis and said, gee, I'd really like to make this movie. Uh, uh, you know, I, th I know a way to do it, low budget, and we, it would really be good. And he said, well, I already have $350,000 into the script. If you were gonna do it, you'd have to pay me and Warner Brothers back. So I said, well, that won't work because there won't be enough money left for me to make the movie. But listen, I think it's fantastic movie script. I, do, I wouldn't mind producing it. Let me run with it for a few days. And so the next day I gave it to Bob Rafelson, told him to read it. And uh, a day later I called him, I said, well, what do you think? He said, well, I haven't read it yet. I said, well, you better read it tomorrow or you know, France, I got to call Francis back. So the next day I called Bob Rafelson and he says, uh, I say, well, what do you think? He says, hey, you know, Vietnam. Nah. So uh, I call Francis back and I say, Francis? He says, wait, wait, don't say a thing. Don't you say one word. I want you to know that I've been thinking about it since you called and I'm going to do it myself. Wow. Not for sale. Wow. Anyway, that's the little apocalypse story. Brilliant. That's in the book. Do you ever read sec, scripts? That's my last I, question. Is, do you ever read scripts? What? There's one. There's one more part of that story, which didn't didn't they change the ending of it? Which yeah, goes, yeah. which a no, spiritual it, ending to which you didn't feel that it was understood. Yeah, yeah. Milius had an ending that was much more like Conrad in The Heart of Darkness. He really brought you into the hell of war, whereas Francis rewrote the last part and filled it with intellectual stuff that Dennis Hopper said. And it was clear that he had no, none of the emotional power of the Melia script. And I think that was partly because Francis had never been to war. But uh, yeah, that's true. Is there a way to reach you, Paul? I'm gonna step off, but is there a way to reach you? Sure, paul.williams at yahoo.com. Beautiful. Thank you. It's inspirational. All right. Enjoy the book. I think you'll like it. Other questions? Okay, because I, I can come up with more. I'm, I, 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 I can ask some other if you don't mind. Uh, sure. I, uh, Paul, how, how does it feel when you were constantly ahead of the time? You would want to make a movie, and then three years later, that topic would be making billions of dollars and your film either got overlooked or never made yeah well it's, it's it was strange i just saw my daughter uh a few days ago and she said you know everything you said dad has come true <laughs> for 40 years um but yeah uh it, what my point of view is not so good for an artist. I mean, I was always making films about what was happening now, not looking back from a distance. And that's one of the problems you get into if you try to do things that are too contemporary. Because films take a while to make and times change. And and the things you are right, there, there are lots of films I wanted to make, which eventually would have been, it's timing. Uh, Dick Lester, Richard Lester used to have this theory that there was six months of zeitgeist for any movie. And if you hit the zeitgeist right for your movie, you had a hit. And if you missed it, even if it was a great movie, 
you wouldn't have a hit. And uh, so that's why some very good movies don't do well and some very bad movies do exceptionally well. I mean, I remember there was once a movie about rats. It was so bad that the audience hooted and howled at it. But that was part of what was fun about it. The audience was ready to make fun of the movies and it became a community experience to see the movie and yell at the screen. But uh, it's odd. Is I was glad you I, I was glad you included in the book the story about um your warning people about uh bin Laden because oh, that yeah. that, was, that that one is clear documentation that you knew it was coming it's it's easy for you to write a book you know 20 and 30 years later and say oh yeah I knew it in advance I knew it in advance but here you've had clear documentation that you not only knew in advance but you told a bunch of people about it even to the extent that you were worried that the CIA was going to come after you when it actually happened. Yeah, well, you know, I had been doing research on Pope John Paul II for a movie about the Pope that uh, Tom Monahan, the guy who founded Domino's Pizza, had given me money to make a movie because the Pope was a good friend of his. And so I would spent a couple of years doing research on Carol Boitia and Pope John Paul II. He became Pope John Paul II. And anyway, when he was in the Philippines, bin Laden put on about nine altitude bombs on almost every plane that the Pope could have possibly been on. So that they were all explode at the same time. And that plot was discovered just, you know, about six hours before the Pope was going to take off. Mm -hmm. And I knew that bin Laden loved airplanes. So when the thing went into the towers, I knew it was him. And I had sent that Christmas card out to all the people. So, uh, but I didn't, uh, on the one hand, I didn't get in any trouble because you know, I don't matter, nobody cares. But on the other hand, I did get my CIA file and it was heavily redacted, but uh, I don't know. I seem to have never gotten in serious trouble for anything I did. And I don't know. I think somebody may be watching over me in a good way. I have no idea. Not supernatural, but actually somebody. I have lots of friends. I don't know if somebody I think, you know, could be in the CIA who, because Harvard, you know, is the, if that's where they get half the guys to the CIA. Uh, or they used to. I don't know. It may be different. But back in the day, uh, they, you know, half the place was filled with Harvard guys. So I have no idea what friend might or might not have been there. It's strange. I once asked somebody, why didn't they recruit me? I have a great movie cover. Yeah, I travel. I'd be a great CIA agent. And they said, well, number one, you can't keep a secret. Number two, you're on the wrong side. No, I don't know. Hey, is that Clive Zickel? My God, I finally have seen you. Hi, Clive. Can somebody turn on his 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 sound? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm uh, I'm in Culebra, which, uh, as you know, that's where I live. Sure. Same uh, same idea as you in Brazil. You know, get away from get get away from all the chaos uh, right. that we see in the cities. Um, although, like you, I also need to get away from here from time to time uh, and visit places like LA and New York. Um, right. But it is very quiet, and yeah, we're close to nature, like you are. Mm. Right. 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 Yeah, yeah. It was well, very good to see, nice you, to see you too. Pardon? It's good to see you. Yeah, hey, and you, and you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but a uh, fasc fascinating life you, you have lived. It's incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was interested to know how long did it take you to write this book? Uh, is it something that you have been working on for quite a few, or you had been working on for quite a few years, or did you just decide to do it and then just go through uh, all that that list of I think you said seventy two or so uh, instances that you wanted to write about? Did what was it a long journey? I did know as my life evolved that 
I was having some pretty amazing experiences in the real world and in the extraordinary world. And that I wouldn't remember the details. So I hired a fairly well-known uh, oral historian in about 1990. Uh, her name was Nira Atiyah. She had written some books. She was the United Nations oral historian. Uh -huh. And I hired, she, we spent 10 two hour sessions and she, where she would interview me and record and then transcribe. So I had 10 hours, well, 20 hours of tapes where, mm -hmm. you know, I told her about the peyote trip or the, mm -hmm. you know, my in-laws or whatever. And, uh, so that was a, a, a big help. Um, but I always knew if I lived to be old, I would probably write a book. Mm. And, uh, so when the, when the pandemic came, well, I had started to noodle around anyway, but yeah. then the, the pandemic got me very serious about it. And it was about five years of hard work. Ooh, hard work is amazing. wrong way to say it, yeah. of intense yeah. work. It was fun. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. I, they they say that everyone has a book in them if if they are willing to find the topic to write it on. Um, very few people do it, but uh, you know it's quite amazing what you've done. Yeah, well, I, I guess stories. I wanted to empty myself before I died, yeah. not to celebrate yeah. myself, to talk about yeah. all my different. <laughs> <laughs> really you know, fantastic all, it is fantastic uh, not, a, not a celebration you know i was thinking about it today oh i said kathy rossi i gotta see her okay is that really your first part of your life you're building up your ego you know your ideas right. get stronger and stronger and whatever and you really have to build up your ego to some extent before you start bringing it down right um, and right. so that forms a very good uh, structure for the book. And the first right. part is building up your ego, and the second part is yeah. destroying yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the other thing is that as you're going through the up cycle, right, you don't have time to write a book anyway. You just right. don't. You're too busy living the life you're, you know, you're on the path that you're on. Right. And then I guess when you go somewhere where it's very quiet and, you know, th there's a lot of, um uh, peace and quiet uh and you can concentrate uh you can write yes 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 but i've always mm. been interested in this mm. uh yeah. understanding I've, I've always been a bit detached so mm -hmm. and I, i've always been a bit not fulfilled so mm. i'm constantly looking for what it is i my my life was missing mm -hmm. looking for that it was like kind of a north star yeah. Well, yeah. it's an inspiration well, to me it is anyway oh, great right, great right. yeah didn't you yeah. say though that you have another book in the works or something in the works or well, look what i've discovered this is sort of funny is that there's a cottage industry of film writers and you know that the new hollywood is now a very popular topic for film students and film historians and this film historian this guy i'm like an archaeological find you know nobody knew about me and this guy found me and read this book and said oh my god this is a seminal figure of some sort let me get into it and he's the one who got the book published and then he went through my oxnard storage room which had tons of stuff in it and he put together, you know, there are a lot of wonderful Hollywood stories that I did not put in the book because they didn't really relate to the evolution of the essence coming through the personality. So, but they're still great stories. So he took those stories that I didn't put in the book, plus interviews he did, and then he found stuff from my childhood pictures and posters and stories and essays and lots of pictures and you know I made it a point not to put any pictures in the book 
But like the cover of this book is called Emissions, Omissions, and Illustrations, a Paul Williams anthology by edited by this guy, Paul Cronin. But anyway, this, the cover is me dancing with some Cuban uh, student in the hills of Cuba as Terry Malick and Francis Coppola look on from their seats. Um, and, you know, one of the first stories in the book is the completion of a story I tell in my book, which is how Oliver Stone was sitting on the side of a, of a, a Mekong uh, River with a, um, uh, with a friend who had a sniper scope and a, a night scope and they'd sit killing the Viet Cong and the bullets would knock them over and leaving just dust images of themselves. Uh, and I used that right after I talked about my father dying because I thought that image of the ghost was apropos um, for talking about death. But the part of the story I didn't tell, which I put in the neck in the other book, is that whenever they attacked the Viet Cong positions and went over the edge and started shooting like crazy, they all, all the men had erections and spontaneous ejaculations. Who knew that? <laughs> Not me. Uh, I thought that was an amazing fact that. Uh, uh, well, it just blew me away. And I, it's stuff like that. That's why I call it emissions, omissions, and illustrations. So do you have another movie in you, or you think that's just not where you are anymore? No. no I mean, if somebody said, here's, you know, it's not, it's certainly I couldn't do a, a, a low budget movie, which is all anyone would offer me. I just don't have the, uh, I'd have to do it from a wheelchair. You know, it's a lot of work directing. Uh, unless you have a lot of help, like Spielberg, or, you know, once you get up there, you get all the help in the world, you can direct movies till you die. But when you got low budget, you got to really put a lot of work into it. You don't have the expert staff. So you've worked with lots of actors. Do you have any favorite actors or are they, are there people that inspired you as actors? Well, I would say any actor who does really honest work is always interesting, you know? So, you know, Robert Duvall and John Voight and, uh, uh, Jack Nicholson, uh, Walter Matthau was incredible. Uh, Walter Matthau was an incredible guy. Um, I didn't actually talk these guys into being in a lot of the movies you actually didn't make, right? Say that again? You, talk, you actually talked, well, in your book, you talk about all these actually famous actors, including giving Tommy Lee Jones a role in a movie he did do with you so he could get a SAG card. Right. Yeah, well, Al Pacino was supposed to play the Seymour Cassell role in The Revolutionary. And he had it down. He had Abby Hoffman down. He could do all of Abby's moves and his voice. And he, was, he would have made the movie great. But two weeks before we started shooting his agent called me and said they didn't want him playing second fiddle to John Voight so I'm gonna have to get somebody else and that was very late in the game so we had to quickly go to Seymour Cassell who was a nice actor but not Al Pacino and he also couldn't really handle the intellectual dialogue for you know talking about political issues so when mm. he came to London I didn't know that when he came to London I went and met him and he, we run an elevator together. There's a pretty woman in the elevator. And as she was pushing the buttons, he put his head on top of her head and started trying to pick her up with a Donald Duck voice. Oh my so, God. 
And then the next day we were on the set and he has to do the scene with John Boyd where he says, you want to talk dialectic? I'll talk dialectic. Blah, 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 blah. And he gives a whole, you know, a really nice yippy speech. But Seymour couldn't understand a word of what the dialogue was. And which was disheartening. And uh, I said, okay, remember how you were trying to pick up Black Carol with the, that woman with the uh, Donald Duck accent? When John does that, you say, you want to talk dialectic? I'll talk dialectic. <laughs> which was less intellectually substantial, but it actually made the scene work. So are you headed back to Brazil after this or you have other stops? No, no. After LA, I'm next when is it? Sunday. Sunday morning, I, I head back to Brazil. Cool. It's been here a month. It's been interesting. I have to say that it's really interesting. You know, the, the US, when you're here, is... Uh, you know, you really get the feeling of a, of a, of a country that's flailing around. Um, and, uh, you know, in Brazil, you see the, the rest of the world realigning itself. I mean, this thing about American exceptionalism and primacy is definitely dissipating now with uh, China, Brazil, India, they're getting together and it's, you know, Brazil's making deals with China, Russia, and the United States. Uh, so it's very interesting to see that this century is not going to be American, a, a century of American hegemony. It's definitely moving to some other area, but frankly, I think the whole political thing is a little, you know, it's diverting, you know, this Ukraine thing, you know, you certainly can pay attention to it. But I think any kind of nationalistic stuff right now is just a delusion and a distraction from the concerted mass effort that would be needed to save the planet from catastrophic climate change. And the longer you go on with wars that stop <laughs> approaching that problem, the more you're guaranteeing the doom of the planet. I mean, I can't believe that the rate of CO2 entering the atmosphere is going up. I mean, you would have thought by this time it would at least stay the same or go down. But now they got this war and people are starting to burn more coal. So, you know, this goes back to my thing about capitalism destroying uh, is a suicidal trip. Strange. So anyway, I, I like Brazil. I've seen the maps and God knows I'm interested. To see, I, I mean, it's so interesting to see what's going on. Uh, you know. So you did uh, New York and Boston and then you came here or? I actually went to Princeton and then Harvard and then here. My cousin who was a professor of history and I was talking to him in Princeton. And then I saw Howie Gardner and Sandish Meacham in. Uh... Well, and, and I will say Howard Gardner did try to sign up for this. However, I was in my car on my way here. Uh huh. Uh, well, that's OK. He's heard enough. <laughs> the stuff we talked about. Anyway. Um... Is there anything you would have done differently or? Or was that not possible? Well, again, you know, I think we all are, you know, I was a victim of my childhood. And, uh, you know, uh, I was definitely a, a damaged person trying to make his way through life. And, uh, you know, basically my life was how to get over that damage and get it to some clarity. So in that sense, I'm, I feel finally, I'm quite, you know, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, you know, I certainly have, many people would say I missed, uh, well, my friend Charlie used to say, boy, if I lived your life, I would have committed suicide four times. But, 
you know, I, I just, uh, partly due to my damaged psyche and partly due to my quest for my own particular happiness, I certainly did miss out on a lot of uh, uh, what we have, many opportunities to make a lot of money. <laughs> you think that would have made you happier? No, not at all. No, because, you know, I experienced, you know, what it means for money to have a marginal utility of zero. And I was very young because my wife was, you know, great heiress. So there was no limit on, I mean, we couldn't spend one tenth of her income. Uh, so, you know, we gave away 90% of it each year. But yeah, that was a great thing to learn. Uh, that uh, you're not going to get happy just by having a lot of money. Mm. In fact, I just say very often it gets in the way of getting uh, clear of your defenses and clear of your ego. Yeah, I don't know if we have any young people on, but do you have any advice for them? Because they're all here. I know that a lot of people who are recent grads from Harvard come to Southern California for the business, music, theater, screenwriting, whatever. You have advice for them? Well, it's funny, you know, after I came to Hollywood, I went back to Harvard because there were very few Harvard people in Hollywood. About Jack Lemon. And uh, what was it? There was a guy who did Downhill Racer. Uh, there are very few Harvard people in Hollywood at all. I went back to Harvard. I gave a little talk, Carpenter Center, to about 50 people, saying, boy, you ought to come to Hollywood. There aren't a lot of smart people out here. And uh, you'll do very well. And I know a few of them came and did do fairly well. Uh, yeah, we're right now. What? Jonathan Lithgow. Well, and, and Jonathan Kaplan was one of the guys too, who was back then. But uh, uh, no, the only advice I'd give young people is don't have kids. <laughs> That's about all I'd say. Try to enjoy yourself. But I, I, I personally think that, uh, you know, you know the, Movie, you know, I, I kind of agree with Woody Allen on this, that the movies are a distraction. And uh, if you find movies interesting and making them interesting, you should make them. And if you can make them interesting to other people, that's fine too. But, you know, keep in mind, they are a distraction for dealing with life and death. So, uh, yeah. That's what I, that's what I, the, my main thing to kids would be think seriously about why you're having kids and what exactly you think is in store for them. I know that seems kind of doomy and gloomy, but that's especially now, especially now with what's going on in the world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say enjoy yourself. Don't spend 10 years changing diapers because yeah. uh, you're not in for a good time in 10 years. And frankly, even sooner. Hopefully you're not changing diapers for 10 years. That's quite a, quite a long time. Usually <laughs> <Right. laughs> it's two years. Yeah. You know experience. I mean. Yeah. The, the reader of the book is certainly rooting for the character Paul Williams in the book. And, and to some extent being disappointed at some of your setbacks. Uh -huh. And well i i don't know you may not have intended it that way but you, that doesn't it can't help coming across you sort of yeah. want you to get what things that you deserve um if it, it, it even if it wasn't an issue of the money there are some wonderful films that i would have loved to have seen your versions of as as you describe in the in, in the book there are times when people disregarded your advice or they used a different actor than the one that you, you thought should be in there um and, and, I, I feel that way particularly if only about one film, which was Stepford Wives. But that, that, I, yeah, I think that. I could have made a much better Stepford Wives than the one that they made. And so did William Goldman, by the way. So, uh, 
That, uh, that's the only one I regret a little bit, but I just finished studying with the Sufis and I, they, they had an insane producer. I said, look, I love this script. I can do it really well. I explained to Goldman how I would do it. He loved the idea. And the producer calls me and says he was head of Palomar Pictures or something. I want you, you know, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna make a lot of money? And I said, well, I mean, I'm, I know how to do this film well, and I think it'll do very well, but I don't know. I'm, I can do my work and I can do it. He said, I'll call you up tomorrow, you know? You, know, you better be enthusiastic. Well, you know, from the book, I never could say, yeah, we're gonna make a million billion dollars. Hey, hey, hey. And so he went off for a director who didn't understand the material. Goldman took his name off it, but still, it was enough of a story that it was quite popular, but it could have been a terrific movie. You know, like ordinary people came along some years later and they used, what's her name? That TV actress. Mary Tyler Mary, Moore. Mary Tyler Moore to be the neurotic because she was neurotic. You know what I mean? And that was kind of my idea for Stepford Wives to get a lot of bad TV actresses to be the Stepford Wives. And then have a few really good actresses act poorly for the first part of the movie and then emerge as you know really wonderful people. Huh. But, did you ever regret did you ever regret being as as honest as you were? It, it just it, even if you could have abandoned your integrity for a few moments and then and then going back. Well, um, you know, it, it, you it, have it, to admit to your own failings as a human being. I I was definitely brought up in the wild way i mean i was told that not to you know to work hard and not win <laughs> be be the best and don't make more than your father uh, you know a lot of crazy stuff that i had to deal with but uh i you know i i really at this age i'm fine with it all it was it was it was not boring i mean the one thing here i'll say something the one thing I really loved my whole life was women. And I, I always had a great time with them and really enjoyed them. And if you see that as the through line of my life, I've done just, I just had a wonderful life. Uh, you know, we make movies in order to get dates uh, <laughs> on some level. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess being in love is a is a wonderful feeling. And uh, I certainly, uh, you know, was honest with myself when I was in love and when I wasn't and pursued that. Um, so that's interesting. You know, if you're in a loving feeling with somebody, well, there's nothing, and everything's okay. Um, I think. It, certainly from reading the book, you don't get the impression that many of these studio heads achieve those positions because of their great intellect or their or their judgment. In some cases, it was just they happened to be in the right place at the right time, and then they're able to make bad decisions for a number of years. Well, I don't know. So the, I met some studio heads that, like Jennings Lang, had a really good understanding of story and event. And he, he actually, I mean, he was a hard drinker, <laughs> but he's a big, I remember once I brought him a story called West Coast about four guys going down the, the rapids with one girl. And they, the four guys all have ego problems, macho ego problems, and they all sort of self-destruct and trying to get the raft down the river. And it's only the woman who comes through with the uh, calmness and ability to do objectively what's necessary to get through the rapids and, and, <laughs> and get to the end of the river. It was way ahead of its time. You know, women's lib, uh, all that came 10 years later. But anyway, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a, like most of my projects, it was way before its time. But anyway, I brought it to Jennings and he read it and he said, yeah, but you know, you need somebody big 
to play this woman. You know what I mean? You need a big woman. And I said, well, I, I, I think, you know, Julie Christie would be, you know, would be fine in the role. And he said, no, she's not big enough. We need somebody big, you know, like, like, ah, nobody's big enough today. And <laughs> That's sort of what the movie was about. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, he was, he, but he understood story at one point. Uh, I was got very interested in uh, a guy named Alby Baker, who was invented the daylight jewel robbery. Uh, he was he was an expert at uh, steel. He had a company in New York City that made bar talk. He was a very avant garde record producer, but the way he got his money was by flying out to L.A. and robbing houses of jewels, and then taking the plane back that night and uh and he would and he had quite a night everybody in new york knew he was a jewel thief and he was kind of renowned for it uh and eventually he got caught but he, he spent a lot of time not being caught he would swipe the guest list for the beverly hills hotel you know some kind of uh They'd be having some kind of social event. He'd see all the women who were there and then get a reverse telephone book and find it know that those houses were empty. And he'd dress up in an admiral's uniform with epaulets. And he'd go into the house and run full speed down the hallways, up the stairs to the bedroom. He said, the jewels are always in the back of the bedroom closet or in the drawer by the bedside hmm. and grab the jewels and run at full speed out. He said, if anybody sees you running down a hallway in one of these mansions in an admiral's uniform, they can't put it together with a crime. You know, they think it's weird. Sorry, I liked Albie very much. And I went to see him in Germany and uh, he's quite a character. Anyway, so I wanted to do the movie and I got, uh, what was his name? The guy did Love Story, Eric. Uh, Siegel. Eric Siegel, you know, I said he wanted to, you know, I got him to, I, he was, said he'd love to write this story. So I told Jennings that we'd get Eric Siegel. And he said, ah, that guy can't write. And uh, I said, well, he says, I'll tell you what, how much did he want? I said, $225,000, which was a lot of money back then, but he had, written love story. So Jenning says, all right, tell him I'll pay him $25,000 for 20 pages. <laughs> I can tell from 20 pages whether a guy knows what he's doing or not. And, you know, Eric wrote him the 25 pages and they were shit. And Jenning said, see, I told you, the guy can't write drama. And, uh, uh, I thought I was in real pro trouble with er uh, with Jennings, you know, because I wasted twenty five thousand dollars of serious money. And he said, "No, don't worry about it, kid. We just saved two hundred thousand." But the thing is, I later learned how Love Story happened. Is that basically they had the script for Love Story all written, but they couldn't get it made. So Robert Evans found some. Princeton professor of literature named Eric Siegel and told him he had three weeks to write a novel based on the screenplay, which he wrote in three weeks. And then Robert Evans, when it had it quickly published and bought 10,000 copies and got it on the New York Times bestseller list. And then he was able to sell the screenplay to Hollywood. Insane. That's a real story. That, that's insane. Well, that's true. That's how it happened. Yes, Adrian. My question, hi, Paul. My Good. question is, wasn't Jennings Lang shot in uh, a parking lot? <laughs> wait a minute, do I, wait a second. Is that Adrian? Is Albert. That a, 
Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Paul. Hi. So what I want to know, and I have not read your book yet, but I promise I will. Okay. And I, what I want to know are two things. Wasn't Jennings Lang shot in a parking lot? Yes. In, uh, in Hollywood? I can tell you the story. Yes. Walter Wanger, his wife, he was married to, uh, I've, I've, the name will come to me, a big movie star. And Jennings was making out with her in a convertible on the back lot. And Wanger came by, caught them. He was suspected them for some time and shot him in, you know, and they took him to the hospital. And he eventually got off, by the way, for claiming temporary insanity. But anyway, Jennings, I was with Jennings the night of the New York blackout. We were shooting Nunzio wow. in, in New York. So this is like 1979. Something like that. The was. And so we're in the Cherry Netherlands Hotel. We can't do anything. We're looking out the window at some citizen directing traffic on 57th street and he drops his pants <laughs> and he shows me the scar on his inner thigh and he says see they didn't get you because people used to joke and call him jenning lang instead of jennings lang so thinking that one testicle had been shot off by walter wanger but as it turns out wanger missed and just scarred the inner thigh. So that's a first-hand report. Uh-huh. Well, because I, I've known and his now deceased son, Mike Lang. Oh. Mike really? Lang is a wonderful uh, uh, pianist in Los Angeles, and he recently died. But oh. my other question to you is... Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank I sort you. Of that. Yeah. My other question to you is because you have been kind of a soothsayer to what happened in the past, I would love to know what your plans are for the future. Well, that's, I've certainly been thinking about it. It certainly, I will go back to the jungle and my friend Vivian, who went to school in Switzerland when she was very young and met all kinds of people there before she was kicked out for drug dealing, um, knows everybody. And she has one friend that lives in the very south of, uh, south of Argentina, uh, near the southern tip. And I want to go visit him because I've seen maps of where the, if there is a nuclear exchange in the Ukraine or elsewhere, where the winds will drift. Mm -hmm. And so the only place I could find that was safe was the very southern tip of Argentina and Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I'm going to do. And the other thing is to take a lot of the stories that were not in this book that are in the next book, plus some stories that are in this book, plus some others. And there's a film person who wants to just pick out the stories that are interesting to young filmmakers and film students. And they'll put that together and no, no uh, psychic journey or childhood or anything like that, but just how do you make get to make movies at a low budget and all that? So I'll do that. And uh, then I'll have to get over this book business because the whole book was, you know, supposed to be a cleaning out and a getting rid of emotion connected mm. to certain pictures. Mm. I had successfully done to a great extent. And I'm sure this whole book have thing you? is re-stimulated stuff. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Mr. Happy, I, can, I know your voice. <laughs> I hope so. Oh, what? I don't look right. that like me. I don't I know that. And hi, baby. Hi. How are you? I, I hope to see you tomorrow night. Oh, great. Possibly. 
Right. So I'm just wondering if you remember a wonderful night at the Riviera Motel, re, what is it? MDMA? No. MDMA. One time you said, I just want to know if you're as loving in your heart as in your eyes that I see. Because Paul sees love in people's eyes. That's what Paul sees. He sees heart. He sees love. And you told me that that's what you would see with me. Did you? Uh, yes, absolutely. But, you know, I didn't put it in this book because I... I no, that's okay. Wait a minute, wait a minute, but Kathy, I, with your permission, I'll tell the story of what <laughs> happened did, with you. You already asked actually, me permission before you wrote the book, and I said, sure. Yeah, well, one here's a true thing. When I really looked at Kathy, um, and this has happened to me on occasion, she disappeared. And instead, there was this 19 year old, perfectly quaffed, beautiful young person who looked to me like the Breck. That's how I see the Breck girl, <laughs> you know, those Breck commercials. Honey, I we were in our fifties or sixties by that point, and she said, "Oh, I, I was the Breck, one of the Breck girls." So that's happened a number of times where I look at people, and I had another friend, I, uh, Melissa, who, when I looked at her, her head turned into the head of an elephant. <laughs> and, I'm glad that didn't happen. And to I me. said, to her, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say anything. Eventually, I said, look, I got to tell you this, but when I really look deeply into your eyes, I see an elephant. And she gets up and walks into the other room and brings back a box of books about elephants, picture books about <laughs> elephants, saying, and then brings a book by a psychiatrist that had her <laughs> as one of the case studies in the book about this crazy woman who, uh, thought she had a secret friend, Ellie, Ellie the elephant, and discussed it all as a psychoanalytic aberration. But when I looked at her, she had to sing a, a, a profile with a black eye and that then came into a whole elephant thing. So <laughs> what can I say? I love you, Paul, that's what I could say. <laughs> I hope I see you tomorrow. All right, great. So Ron or Richard or uh, That's me. Cheryl, anyone have? You're muted, Richard. Hey, Paul, how are you, buddy? Oh, Richard Velasquez. Yes, I'm going to see you tomorrow. I'm okay, coming to see you great. tomorrow, okay? Great, great, great. I, I've, been, I've been running around, so I didn't want to be distracting, but I'll, I'll definitely come to you tomorrow. We'll sit and talk. I miss great. you, man. Well, you know, at 4.30 on Wednesday, there's a meet and greet. Tomorrow, it, I, it might be after the movie or something. Yeah, maybe after the movie, but I'll probably see you at the meet and greet as well. I was going to try to make both. All right, great. Good to see it's you. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. I'll talk to you soon, all right? Be well. And I have um, Mitchell and Berenice, Cheryl, Betsy, Ron, Philip. Oh, I just say I really enjoyed this conversation and uh, I'll have to get the book. These are fun times he's describing. So, uh -huh. it, yeah. it's, it's for those of, so I did my 50th uh, reunion and he writes about his 50th, which was some time ago. And I'll say, once you've lived this long, there's so much stuff. <laughs> yeah. So that is, and he's got more stuff than most people have anywhere. Well, I, I grew up as a ski racer, always wanted to be a movie producer. I ended up in the real estate development business. And I go back to Cambridge and Harvard a lot because I do a lot of work with the Rapport family, Jerry Rapport, Jerome Rapport. I'm sure you guys all know who he was. The dad passed away about a year ago, but he was heavily involved. And so I, I now know Mayor Wu and Charlie Baker, and we're doing affordable housing back there. But I go back there because I, I sit on a real estate board. So we're mentoring the Harvard students, and most of them are like 32, and they can mentor me. 
but it's fun <laughs> to go back and teach. And of course, I'm a huge Celtics fan, so I have to go back for that. So I'm, I just came back from being there for a week and I got to go back in a couple of weeks. So Harvard and Cambridge are still there. It's, it's fun to go back and actually be doing work and teaching some of the students. Rick uh -huh. Pizer. How are they it, different? <laughs> how is it different? Are the students? Yeah. Uh, well, when I went, I was a ski racer, went to Vermont and Colorado, Boulder. Boulder in the, uh, my brother went there late 60s, early 70s. So uh, Boulder was pretty much the drug capital of the world. You know, right. you know who was living in Aspen at the time, you know, fear and loathing. Hey, but do, you know, do you know John Steiner? Yeah. I mean, I know yeah. him through. Yeah. He's been yeah. a very good friend of this book. He gave me a lot of good advice along the way. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I always think of real estate developers and politicians and movie producers. We're all kind of the same ilk. You know, we all have big egos. We try to get things built. I build hotels. I build apartments. I built restaurants that have failed. We just opened up a hotel in Napa and Sonoma during COVID uh -huh. and now we're with our banks. You know, I should write movies about why not to be a real estate developer <laughs> and how to lose your ass in real estate development. So I'm based down here in Newport Beach, and um, it was invite. I, I'm glad I got invited on this. I jumped on about five ten because I I just flew back from Salt Lake City, huh. talking to talking to banks there, and got one day of skiing in. So, but, well, you know, um, I think it's a good thing to point out because I don't think I put it in the book, but I made it a point to teach my daughter to to ski very early in life. Yeah. And I could talk to her about spiritual things. Yeah. But skiing, you know, when you try to explain to people what is the whole point of the spiritual trip is to become objective. Yeah. That see what's in front of you objectively. Yeah. Thought is a is a tool, you know. So when you're skiing down a mountain, you're at one with the mountain. Yeah. You're yeah. Somebody comes in your path. You say, "Get out of the way," or and, I just hit them. If there's if there if there's snowboarders, I just hit them. So. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's, <laughs> that's another topic. Me and Gwyneth Paltrow. Just to yeah. define the difference between saying, "Hey, get out of the way," yeah, and seeing, yeah, uh, with the mountain, it's like yeah. the language is a device. Yeah. To allow you to get back into the flow. Yeah. And that's what skiing, it's a good metaphor because when you end up down at the bottom of the mountain after the ski trip and you're yeah. talking to people at the bar, yeah. then you're really using your, your, your history and your experience yeah. to negotiate with people in a social reality. Right. You yeah. have the society of after skiing, yeah. the use of the mind for solving yeah. problems. Yeah. And the oneness of skiing down the mountain for being yeah. objectively present. Yeah. No, I mean, for those of who don't know, I mean, skiing, I can still ski. It was at the top of Alta. They closed the road for five days. They've had so much snow. They've had avalanches. I was stuck up at the top of the Alta mountain because a guy I grew up with basically runs the mountain. We're stuck up with all the snow cats for four days because they closed the road. Wow. So you're up. We're, still, we're eating Slim Jims, drinking beer, and I thought I was 25 again. <laughs> I was in Boulder hanging out with Timothy Leary doing uh, LSD. I mean, nothing's much changed. So, because yeah. I went to architecture school. So, and I was a drummer in the band early on. And, you know, somewhere along in Boulder, we ran into Robert Redford. I'm not friends with him, but he went to Boulder and he got thrown out because he drank too much. He was there in a baseball discussion. So when he did Downhill Racer, you know, they 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 came and talked to us on the New York State ski team about what that was all about. So, my introduction to the movies was like Downhill Racer, Butch Cassidy, no, Sundance. Was directed by a Harvard guy. Huh? Yeah. Downhill Racer yeah. was directed by a Harvard guy. Yeah. I forget yeah. his name. I look at the NCAA championships. It's still Colorado, Vermont, Utah, but Harvard gets in there because they got a, a bunch of good alpine skiers. Because all of us are from New Hampshire and Maine and Vermont, skiing on rocks and ice. So we're still winning all the Alpine races, but it's a pleasure to uh, hear you speak. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but this is one of the best Harvard Club Zoom calls I've been on in the last three years. I, I need to be on more of these. So you're you're traveling around. I did some work in Brazil 10 years ago, but I haven't been back. 
uh, my daughter was was the goalie for the water polo team down here. And Eric Fisher's two daughters were on the Olympic team that went down there. In, um, when was Rio? Uh, 2020? When were the, the, the Laguna Beach High School girls team, two of them were on the U.S. Olympic team that won the gold medal against Hungary in Rio. And then well, they all go. To so it's like, oh, we have a gap here. Oh, yeah. The youngest girl comes back with a gold medal. If you've been in Brazil for a year, would you go back to Laguna Beach High School for your senior year high school? Hell no. You've been living in Rio. But she comes back and competes against my daughter. So, you know, I've always loved Brazil. I used to speak a little Portuguese. So I have to get down there. I have to come visit you in the jungle. So. <laughs> And I ask if uh, Jason Lazarchek or Berenice or Mitchell or Betsy or Cheryl or C. Cuddy have any questions or comments? I think other people have spoken. Well, I'm a blabbermouth, so don't get me started again. So. Uh, but this is fun. I mean, I will say the nice thing about Paul is that he can talk to anybody and everybody. <laughs> Yeah. And 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 there's so many touch points, you know, and that you'll find in the back of his book, I totally agreed, except for one thing on when you're older than 75, I'm not quite there. But he said, put a bottle next to your bed so you don't have to go to the bathroom to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I said, doesn't work for women. <laughs> No, that's that's a guy thing. I uh, uh, I think we are obligated to try to design one for women. It's only yeah. fair. Yeah, I uh, yeah. tried. I can fly into Denver and Aspen. It's two hours. If I drive up to L.A., Ventura, Santa Monica, it takes me three hours. Absolutely. So, yeah, guys, we have wide wide bottle beer bottles in our car because if you pull over to a Starbucks. You never get in the restroom. All the gas stations, the bathroom's been out of order for the last 10 years. Right. Uh, so, yeah. One, it's, of the other, one of the other pieces of advice, I think, is this, that to wear your suspenders outside <laughs> your sweatshirt so that you can drop your pants more quickly. Or that's why they have all these shirts that are untucked, the longer shirts come down, so... If you have a little problem, you can only say I spilled coffee there so many times. And then you just, oh my God, yeah. yeah. All right. So okay, where are you going to be that... next? What? Where are you going to be next? Where are you, you making a round? We have a screening tomorrow at 7.30 and 9.30 at the New Beverly. Uh, out of it, which New Yorker just compared favorably to the Fablemans. Oh, really? Uh, and 9.30 is the revolutionary. And I'm going to do a QA and a in between tomorrow and the next day. They're doing it again. Where is this? Where is it going to be? The New Beverly, the New Beverly Cinema. It's Quentin Tarantino's cinema. So it's right in uh, West then, LA? Yeah. Right and, in then the, and then the book signing is at Cantor's Kibbutz Room? Yes, the Kibitz Room at Cantor's at 4.30 on Wednesday. You're going to have book signing and meet and greet. And then Isn't that on Thursday or Wednesday or Thursday? Wednesday. Wednesday. Thursday, I'm going to be at Larry Edmonds Bookshop. It's a cinema bookshop at 7 p.m. for a couple of hours. But where is, where is the place on Wednesday so I don't forget? What's the address of the... Uh... I don't know. It's the new Beverly Cinema. No, but on 4.30 on Wednesday. Wednesday at 4.30. Oh, no, that's Cantor's Deli. Oh, Cantor's Deli. Fairfax. On Fairfax. Yeah, I know where that is. All right. Everyone knows Cantor's. I know where Cantor's is. Yeah. No, this is great. I'm glad we have you in Los Angeles for a while. Well, and, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad people uh, were interested. And uh, I hope they enjoyed it. What? This was fun because, you know, we people got to have some conversations with you, especially some new people, some old people. It was kind of cool. I, I liked it. Okay, great, great. I was happy to do it. Thank you for having me. 
It was Can really cool. There's four minutes if you want to ask something that you're dying to ask. Well, I'm going to see him at the deli on Wednesday. I'd love to come up tomorrow. I know it's so hard because you're down in Orange County, huh? Well, I drive up for him. There's not many people I drive up for, but hell. <laughs> Orange right. County. Hey, I'll just get my driver and I'll do everything on Zoom on the way up. What's yeah, the address? The new Beverly Theater. I'm intrigued now. I'm in town. What's the, what's the address? Uh, let me. I'll Google, Google it. Google it. Yeah, uh, I. I have this slow email. The place is called the New Beverly Theater. Yeah, New Beverly Cinema. I think. New Beverly Cinema. Oh, or I should, I'm just so if you go to my Facebook page, it'll give you everything you need. Yeah, I'm not allowed to go to my Facebook page because it's being managed by a man in Cape Town, South Africa. That's correct. And if I go there, they'll know it, they'll think it's a bot and take it down. Well, we got, so even, I got the address. Yeah, go ahead. 7165 Beverly what? Boulevard. 7165 Beverly, Beverly Boulevard, Boulevard 90036. But it's it's Beverly Boulevard in what West LA or what? Los Angeles. LA. It's in the Fairfax area too. Kind All of. right, 7 30 and 9 30. Sounds yeah. like it's you gotta get there. All right. Yeah. Since okay. 2017, it has been owned by filmmaker Quentin Tarantino. Right. Well, Mr. William, Paul, it's a pleasure to meet you. I uh, I have to get up there tomorrow. I just gotta. I'm gonna have to get my butt up there. <laughs> okay. right. well, hey, if it works out, that'll be great. I, and you it's know, it's been a I mean, pleasure oh. to meet all of you. Yeah. And it was happy for me to host. Yeah. To be a, a it's nice host. to meet you too. My gosh. This is great. Yeah. Paul, thank you for doing this. All right, my pleasure. I'm, I'm glad I got to see you, Clive. Well, and you're, yeah. In where are you, Cambria, did you say? Where Clive, am I now? Clive Zickel, you're in? Oh, he's in Calegra. Calegra? Where's that? Calabria. Oh. Puerto Rico, I think. Oh, my God. We've got people yeah. there. He's in Puerto Rico, yeah. Yeah, because Luke was on from South Africa. He says, I'm not sure how long I can stay. <laughs> well, Luke, well, it's almost over. I'm, we got one more minute. I'm boring. I'm in California, so I'm not very uh, uh, excited right now. So, yeah. Okay, Mitchell, I see you. You want to say something? Where's Luke? He's in I'm South sorry, Africa. You're, you're on that Luke? No, that's Jeff Markey. That's Jeff. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate your sharing this with us. Oh, well, it's been my pleasure. Uh, Buy the book, because it's really a good a read. Good, wait, that's a very good point. You know, if yes. you go to Amazon, Harvard Hollywood Hitman, you'll get the book, which is, I guarantee you won't be bored. Hey, no, I'm looking forward to it. It's a great read. Amazon's going to bring it to my house in about two hours. I, I, I really <laughs> The Amazon truck's coming around the corner now. <laughs> Although, so you will, however, and he's already told me, because I said, you know, you started out so narrative, but toward the end, it was like really episodic. Like, is that the way you felt? He said, no, I had to go. I couldn't keep writing. I just yeah. had to be done. Yeah. So he knew what the end was going to be. So the end goes beautifully. It's, yeah. it's beautiful. But in that interstitial part, it's like, hmm, now we're jumping around a little. And yeah, it's but a lot of those stories, I just couldn't not tell because they were so <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that's an actual valid criticism of the book. I think the book was inventing a new way of, of writing a memoir. It's very unusual the the the, the episodic the, well, I love each, it. each episode is sort of wonderful by itself but the the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts Absolutely. And you, you, you get all the way through it and you realize there are certain themes that are running through it from the beginning and it's a very Absolutely. effective way of presenting the material yeah okay well 
the dog is barking and I'm told I'm done by my hostess here. Thank you so much. Thank Our you. Host. Thank, so you much Thank you. All right. Fun. And I will write great. to people I didn't get on, but thank you all for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Great you. Thanks for hosting it, Marsha. Thank you. Okay, Joe, we can cut this off.